right, so welcome back to today's show. Really excited today. Billy Keel is on the show. Billy, uh, I was lucky enough to be on his podcast a, a few months back. Incredible in- energy, incredible show, incredible story. Does so many things, and he's actually overseas here. Um, has had a very uh, successful track record in other areas, including a full time job, and has now made the choice and made the transition. Just noting the uh, the, the the limited time we have here to do what we do has made the transition to go full time into an investor. And so Billy, welcome to the show. I want to dive in a little bit on your bio here. Uh, But as a high wage earner, you have one piece of the puzzle, great income to support you and your family. But deep downside, you know, earning that high salary comes at a cost, freedom. Specifically, the freedom over your time, the freedom you choose, how to spend your time, with who you spend your time, and more often than not, when and where you spend your time. Now, this is coming from Billy's bio here, but it speaks true to really what drew Peely and I to large multifamily. We were looking for a, a road to get back our time with our kids. And Billy says he's just a regular guy. We, we will learn a, a lot a lot about that, but that far from it. From a middle-class family from Columbus, Ohio, grew up from nothing about it, knowing nothing about investing. And when he started to become successful in his career, he had no idea how to invest with a high salary. And it was too embarrassed to just ask because he felt like he should have known, right? And there's probably a lot of you mm-hmm. out there right now thinking that same thing. And I've been in that position too, sitting in the audience and not asking the question when usually the question would benefit about 30, 40, 50 other people sitting there in the same room wanted to ask that question as well. He uh, heard colleagues talking about being a credit investor, giving them fake nods like he knew what was going. And from that point on, he gave himself the challenge of learning everything he could about all things money and investing. And his mission was to turn uh, high wages into financial freedom. Eight years later, he achieved it creating a monthly passive income that met all of his expenses, no longer need to work. And really just if he didn't want to, he didn't have to. Although we'll learn today, he still loved what he was doing. Now his mission is to guide others on that path to freedom. So Billy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us here and appreciate you uh, coming on to share your story. So um, tell audience where you are right now. Yeah, Jason. So, and it is, I mean, it's every time I see you, like I just get motivated. It's just like, wow, something cool is going to happen. So uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here, share a bit more of my story with you. And yes, you absolutely crushed it, by the way, when you were on my podcast on the Going Long podcast, episode 202. Everybody check him out. He was awesome. He was amazing. And uh, today I am still in the same place we were before. I'm still here. And as the locals would say is Barcelona, España. So Barcelona, Spain is where I have been living for the last 15, almost 16 years. And I've actually been living over here in Europe for 21 years, which was actually supposed to just be a one year sabbatical. So, you know, it's incredible because you you talk in your journey, how that you thought because of the position you were in, you know, high wage earner doing very successful Mm -hmm. in your business, they should know the other things, right? And sometimes it becomes that we, you know, we grow up as little kids and we, we ask a million questions and we get to adults and we feel silly asking those questions, right? And a lot are sitting here listening in that same position. What were some of the first hurdles that you had to overcome to set yourself in the right path to where you are today? Yeah. So, you know, what? one of the very first things was I had to adapt the similar type of mindset like I have that that I realized, like I've learned four additional languages since I've left um, the United States and since I've been living in Europe. Right. I'm a native American English speaker and I've learned Spanish. Catalan, which is the language they speak here locally. Um, I lived in Italy, so I speak Italian uh, and also French. And so <clears throat> one of the things that happens is when you're an A student, because I'm very much I was an A student in college and you get used to studying really hard for the exam and then you get a good grade. And then the teachers tell you, awesome, your friends are like, great, you got the highest grade. And you kind of forget what it's like to go back to this beginner or child's mindset. Mm-hmm. And I fell into that trap because when you get at a a certain point in your life, you just think, hey, listen, everybody's going to come to me because I have all the answers. But you're very much humbled. And the thing that I had to go back to is getting to what it was like to be a new arrival in France. I didn't speak the language. I didn't understand the culture. And the only way that I could get around was by getting an education, baseline education, going out, taking that education, taking it to the streets to then see actually what between the theory that I knew and being able to speak and order or fix things uh, like not being able to get my utilities turned on. And when I got the feedback that I was still not doing it properly, I had to surround myself with people that knew more than I did. And so I had to remember what it was like to learn languages when I realized that I didn't know enough about money. And I also realized that if I just kept doing 
working, focusing on my day job, that there was as much risk in my day job, like maybe my number was going to be called and I'd be sacked, as there was in any other kind of risk that, you know, walking out in front of your car or something like, or in front of a car or something like that. So it really took me from moving away from that, hey, A plus student or A student to going back to being the child's mindset and realizing that you're not a native speaker, Billy, but in order to get better at any language, including the language of money, you have to get a baseline education. You have to be willing to go out, take action. And you also have to surround yourself with people that are going to hold you accountable for the things that you're learning. So you can go from theory to real practical knowledge. You know, so hopefully that helps. It does. And and one thing that came up here is, you know, you worked a corporate job for a number of years. And what, what I see is that there's so many people that, that rush and say, I just can't wait to quit my job. Right. And, but the hardest thing is the fear of quitting because you've been guided by a path that's been one dictated for you or provided. Right. And you've had guidelines here to going into this uncertainty here. And they'll, they'll step away from the ledge numerous times. Or even if they do break the mold and quit that job, they'll, they'll quickly look for something else for security, which basically is tying them back into another job here. How did you set your mind? right when you made this transition to adapt to just really a change of and the change isn't isn't necessarily I don't think uncertainty is the word but just a, a new you're basically making your own day right you're choosing your yeah. own yeah it's a, it's a new reality right at the end of the day and so one of the things that happened was because I was also very fortunate and you can be in your job and you're, and you're enjoying your job and you're going through the motions and you realize that you're good at your job and because you're good at your job you get more uh, recognition. The more recognition you get, the more uh, work that you get put on your desk, and the more work you get put on your desk, the more work that you're crushing through because you want the next promotion. Like that is a path that I was definitely going through. And at the same time, because I was working in sales and sales leadership in enterprise software, right? So this is like cutting edge industry and large margins and stuff like that. It was absolutely fantastic because even every with each promotion, you also got a nice raise. Sometimes they were bigger than others, but you, you realize that the more work that you do, the more that you were going to get put on your plate. And so as things continue to move forward, it was a matter of saying, okay, well, listen, I have all of these different, um, these different things that are on my plate. I continue to move forward. I continue to get things done. But I also realized because I was having a high income at the same time, Jason, I realized, wow, you know what? I'm going to this job every day. I'm getting more responsibility. I like what I do. But I wasn't passionate about software sales or enterprise software sales. I wasn't passionate about it. And so the reason I tell that is because for about four years, I was continuing to go through the motions. Why? Because I was in a job that I was understanding. It didn't take me that much mental power or, or stress. At the same time, I was still away from family and I was traveling and I was doing other things. But I realized that I was just going through the motions. And the thing that it actually took to go from being in that really cushy job and going through the motions and sometimes people talk about the golden handcuffs was the last the latter part of last year so the fourth quarter of last year my father actually had some very important health problems hmm. to the point that it, I flew back from Spain once in September October November to be with my dad my brother and sister my, my stepmom to accompany him and so I realized that what it took for me to actually make the move had nothing to do with either the responsibility I was having or the money that I was making, but it was the finality of life. Because although my dad's getting better today, I was at a point where I was in the, in the ICU. He spent about three weeks there. I was there for, with him for about seven or eight days. And I realized while I'm there and I'm watching him on these machines that are keeping him alive that do I really want to keep doing this job that I'm doing? Not that I dislike it, because I liked it. And to, you, to your point earlier, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I, I didn't see that that was the where I'll be all, what I was going to help to move me and my family forward forever. And so that event is what gave me more the, the motivation to say, hey, listen, I want to do something else in life. And I made that decision recognizing that I wasn't necessarily fully prepared, but what I wasn't prepared to do anymore, Jason, was just to keep going through the motions. Yeah. And probably in the beginning, I didn't really share a lot of that, but I feel like this happens to a lot of us. It takes something that has absolutely nothing to do with your role, with money, to make you make a change. And hopefully you can think about the things that are happening in your life today. And you don't have to wait for an event that is potentially finite or, or final for you or, or a loved one to be able to make the decision to, to, to stop, to break that cycle, to not just continue to do things just because.
Yes, yeah, so hopefully that helps. It, it does. That shift in identity is, is hard for a lot to to um, to really swallow, right? Because you get you get locked up, and you hear it with people who have trained their whole life just for the Olympics or some kind of sport or some some job they're known for, right? Not to break that identity, they feel that that's them, right? And I think living in mm-hmm. Europe, you probably see a lot of different points because there's a lot more point put on time and freedom and, and enjoying the space and then work is to sustain yeah. life, not so much you know uh, life to sustain work, and we get on this road here where, where we just work, 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 but we don't know what the end result is. And you, you did it very, um, we'll say conceptually, you said, okay, what, what do I need to live on here? And that's gonna be my passive income, right? And I hear that conversation so much is that once I just get enough passive income, I'll quit my job. But the, if you just ask the same question, well, what is that number, right? They, they don't have it dialed in. And that can be the simplest thing, just what does it cost you to live every month, right? Like not not yep. you going out, spurred and do whatever you want, but what does it cost you to live, right? And that that's your first yep. step to that goal. Do you do you yep. know? Remember what was that first investment that that you dipped your toe in the, in the water and you said, okay, cool. Like what, what was that first thing here, and, and what what drew you to that out of the gate? Yeah, so and it's really interesting. So the thing that drew me to even getting involved in real estate at all was in 2000. I'd been out of school for like five years. Um, the 2000 <clears throat> the dot com bubble happened, and so coming from a family where both of my parents worked two jobs, very very blue collar, um, I watched them struggle with money. Like at the end of the month they were making decisions do they pay this bill or do they pay the other bill and so i watched that and when i finally got to a point where i somewhat broke that cycle and i was investing um i didn't have anybody i could talk to so i was investing putting all my money in the stock market because somebody came in and said hey listen you know sign this paperwork and this is what you're doing for to prepare for your retirement and i was like cool um and so i signed that but five years later i realized i had no control because the dot-com bubble kind of made the portfolio value go down well, that was good. My the, the financial advisor I had at the time was like, don't worry, just do some DCA. Eventually, it's all going to come back. And he was right. I also found out what DCA meant, dollar cost averaging, like kind of putting the same amount of money in all the time. But then 2008 happened again. And Jason, the problem with that was when my parents always taught me when I was growing up, if something happens once, shame on them. If it happens twice, shame on you. And so I realized I didn't have any control over any of the finances part of my life because I really wanted to have more control because I saw my parents struggle so much. And so that's what eventually started getting me like, what else can I be doing? I happened to be in the States. I saw this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I know lots and lots of people picked it up. Well, I actually picked it up the first time, Jason, but I didn't finish it. I didn't finish it until about three years later. I went back to the States. I was flying. I was a young father. Um, I had um, a three-year-old or soon to be three-year-old and a one-year-old. And the reason that I actually started getting into real estate was When I read this book and I read the Rich Dad Poor Dad book the second time around and then I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I started reading all the other Rich Dad books and all the series books and then I started watching videos and I was listening to podcasts and I was like a literal theoretical ninja. Like, you know the person you ask and they're like, you know, if when you say the revenue minus expenses is your NOI and then the NOI minus your debt service gets you to your cash after debt service or your net profit, et cetera, et cetera. I knew all that stuff. But what started happening was people were saying, okay, well, yeah, well, what's your portfolio look like? And I would go back, you know, and you buy more property and then you have more expenses and I would just go back and yeah, but Billy, but like, what's your portfolio look like? And I realized that I was a theoretical mastermind, but I was not, I was afraid to take action. And so that can happen to a lot of people. But the thing that actually put me into action again, Jason, and it's really interesting how this thing happens in life, but the night before my son's third birthday, I was not sleeping well. I was feeling pretty terrible because the next morning I was taking a business trip. And the thing that happened was I woke up really early that morning, probably like 5.30, 5.45. I woke my wife and our one-year-old up because it was really important to me as a young father. Like I'd always told myself I wanted to be present and I was going to be there for the special events. And so I wanted to get up, wake the, woke the family up early in the morning to sing happy birthday to our three-year-old and to give him a hug and kiss and to run out the door because I was running to the door and I was on my way to a business meeting in Frankfurt. And to this day, Jason, I don't remember what that business meeting was, but I do remember the way that I felt that night because while I was at this dinner for this business meeting in Frankfurt, my wife, our one-year-old, and our in-laws were all together singing happy birthday, blowing out candles for our son. And that feeling is something that I was was really ashamed of. Like, I didn't want to talk about that because it was... It, makes, it made me feel incongruent, like with the person, the father, the man that I wanted to be because I was doing something that was completely different. I got, I got off track. I was chasing the titles. I was chasing the money. And that, more than reading the books, that's what actually made me start to take action to say, I'm not going to ever feel this way again. I do not ever want to miss something like this again. And I've got to 
realize that it's not just about going to this job. It is about how do I also create other streams of income so that I feel like I have more control. And because I'd read the rich dad, poor dad, because I was, I knew all the theory, it was time to take action. So I thought I was going to buy it in Barcelona, ended up, I didn't have enough education because I didn't realize I was in a location that was more about appreciation, not cash flow. So long story, like short, a, a number of friends here in Spain were like, Billy, but you're, you're an American citizen. Like, why don't you just buy back in the United States? And I thought to myself, like, guys, the Atlantic Ocean is between where I live and where I could potentially buy my first property. So it just so happened that after a long time, I, well, actually after eight months, and that pain that I had for my son's birthday, I actually bought my very first duplex and I bought that in New Jersey while I was living in Barcelona, Spain. So it's maybe a long way to answer to your, to your question, but it's the thing that took me, that feeling that actually got me to start to move from the theory and knowing all the stuff to actually going out, making, taking action. I made a lot of mistakes. I lost a lot of money, but I learned a lot as well. So, um, but that's what it took to actually get me to buy my very first property in, in real estate. You know, it's funny because the quote comes to mind, and I'm going to probably butcher it, but uh, it's not, it's not um, what people remember what you said. It's, it's how you made them feel, right? And so that feeling, feeling is what really can drive us a lot because that's what we remember. And that's what, what pushes us to take the, these, these angles. And we, we, can, we, we, just, we create roadblocks, right? We're like, oh, I can't do it because the Atlantic Ocean or this and that, even though I'm a U.S. citizen or at that point, like, how am I going to start, right? And we get on these runways that just feel comfortable because it's easy to feel comfortable and stress. And I mean, you hear like this made up term analysis paralysis thrown out because people were like, oh, they want to feel good about them like oh i'm stuck because i'm analyzing it but there, there's never that point like when is enough enough right and that's usually the question like when's enough enough like if i'm there doing my job like when's enough enough like when do i have enough money um i'm reading this um, yeah. book and I, I just don't recall the offer unfortunately it just but it's uh it's like die with nothing and that's not a bad thing mm -hmm. it's actually a good thing because there, there he's talking about that we, we spend our life to, you know, compile these, uh, you know, savings accounts, all these other things, retirement accounts, all these points for these magical days. We're going to retire 65 or 70, and then we're probably going to be too old to enjoy what we want to do, right? And and you can see these points of like, uh, you know, elderly people on a uh, gondola and are asleep, like just like things like that come to mind, right? Yeah. And we get stuck in that route, but that's what everybody else does. But you're talking about, you know, learning the lesson twice about really stock market crash, dot com bust. And you know, a friend was talking to me the other day how his dad died right after, you know, um, really the crash, right? And his portfolio went down, was down half, right? And so yes, typically, historically, yes, stock market always goes up, but it just depends when you yeah. need it. That really matters most, win, yep. right? And the win is, can you control the win? Not there. Can you control your win here? Yes. And that's a choice that we're, we're always afraid to make, but I'd rather risk on myself. I'd rather risk on you. I'd rather risk on, 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 on us than go and say, yeah. I hope, because hope really, yeah. um, minus Star Wars, has not historically done favored well. Yeah, and hope is definitely not, having worked in sales and sales leadership for 26 years. Hope is also not a strategy, mm -hmm. not a winning strategy. So, uh, yeah, I where, completely agree with you. Where do you go now with uh, your steps forward? Right, so, so you've now accomplished, you know, creating financial freedom, getting enough passive income, replace, you know, of course, create the life you are today. Successful podcast, getting out there, doing a ton. I saw you uh, just recently on my my friend Jason Glar's podcast, right, and other things out there, mm -hmm. right. So on that front. What are the steps forward now? What's the look forward for you and your plan and your process? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that I am, I'm just fascinated by because real estate, what it did is it helped to open my mind and introduce me to new concepts and things like that. So I am as a as a lifelong student, I'm continuing to want to understand more about not just passive income, but also active income. And, and I want to understand about the different investment vehicles. I have a preference for those vehicle or for those vehicles that are hard assets in terms of investment those that kick off cash and those that have strong tax benefits mm -hmm. and 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 so as i continue to learn more i i want to continue to share more and i do continue to share more um, i am doing that now through building the, the business where we're serving other people who are accredited investors and, and a lot of that is helping expose them to the different assets that are available. Today, we're very, very focused on helping people that are accredited investors that typically have a high income, uh, earned income issue. Um, because one of the things that happened for me at the end, like the last two years while I was working in the corporate life, was I realized that I liked real estate. I understood the business model. It was simple enough. And the people that I was either investing with or through, because I'm an active investor as well as a passive investor, um, I realized that if I could keep more of my active income, because I was paying a lot, 40 plus percent in, in earned income, 
if I could keep more of that, if I could even keep half of that, then that gave me more capital to then invest in more passive streams of income. And whether I decided to buy a mobile home park myself or invest with, with you through a syndication, that was one of the things that I was recognizing that really not a lot of people were talking about. There wasn't a lot of exposure to how you can create consistent returns and also keep more of your rather than paying more in income tax was be able to keep more of that um, because I was in a very un unique situation as someone who was a high paid professional, busy professional uh, and also had a spouse who was in a, in a very similar way. So saying all that to say that understanding different vehicles recognizing where we can make the biggest impact. And today that biggest impact is with those people who are credit investors, highway earners, and want to be able to keep more of their income from a, from a payment and tax perspective and also consi create consistent returns. So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's maybe a bit of a mouthful. No, but that's great. Dialed right in. A couple lessons um, learned so far from investing overseas. How have you looked at syndications or, or other parts, particularly if you're looking to invest with operators markets? What, what has been your process to really do this effectively when you, you know, you're yeah. predominantly a couple thousand miles away? Yeah, love that question. And so, and I think the process is pretty similar whether you are an active investor or passive investor. The difference is there's much more onus on you as the active investor, meaning that you're the, you know, you're you are the Jason, Jasons of this world, right? Mm -hmm. Is making sure that number one that you're developing a relationship because I think that that is really that gets lost in sometimes because you're just thinking about okay, well, what's the process? So just like any other process, and I'll take it from a passive investor's perspective that. You know, Jason, you and I meet one another. I've seen your podcast. I'm listening, um, and I really like what you're what you're saying. Or I've seen you on YouTube, right? And so, as I start to understand more about what it is that you're doing, then the next step is, well, how can I enter into your world? You make it very easy. So, I, not only do I consume more of your content, I'm watching what you're doing. You also give the possibility to speak to you. So, um, you know, I'm on your mailing list, and I'm reading the things that you're that you're writing. I'm reacting to what you're doing, and I'm learning, and I'm growing, and I'm getting a chance to meet you more. Also, and I believe, then this is just my own philosophy, because as you're developing a relationship and I'm getting to know the syndicator more, it is a matter of saying, okay, now I need to put my money where my mouth is. And I, and I mean that from a, from a developing the relationship perspective, because when I decide that I want to invest capital with you, then it is a matter of saying, okay, I'm, I've, we've done the Zoom thing, it's great, and I'm planning on deepening the relationship and making purchases or investing capital with you then I wanna meet you face to face. So what I have traditionally done is from the very beginning, whether it's meet, seeing someone on, on YouTube or listening to their podcast, is developing the relationship and doing it in a way that I feel comfortable with. And then ultimately to be able to demonstrate that it's not just about someone who's living thousands of miles away. And for me, it could be Barcelona to New Jersey, or you may be in Honolulu um, to, I don't know, Kansas City. It's the same kind of distance. There's some things different that happen because you're in countries and in currency, but you have to develop, in my opinion, the relationship in that way. And depending on how much you want to deepen the relationship, ultimately, I think you need to get on a plane, get on a train, automobile, whatever it is to meet the person face to face. We use the passive investor through investing capital in a syndication. And it's a very similar thing if you are someone who is syndicating capital and you want to meet an operator. Very similar process, just different people in the way that you are are getting to know one another. And so the distance is the thing that I think can potentially separate you. But because of technology nowadays, Jason, it's very easy. I mean, today we're in, you know, thousands of miles away and we're having this conversation. Eventually, when you want to meet with people, you need to get on a plane, get on a train or get on an automobile is the way that I think have the way that I've thought about it. And that's helped me to be an effective active investor as well as a passive investor. I love it. It's it speaks to the narrative, uh, not not can I, but how can I, right? Constantly just looking that's for the it. way out, and that's gotten to where you are today. And and you're you've been a that's solution it. finder, not not a not a, a problem looking at her, or if that's a phrase there, but yeah. but on that front, you know, it, it, when you can change your mind and put yourself in that perspective and use everything you have to get where you are, you have the success like we hear from Billy today. Billy, mm -hmm. always inspiring. Love what you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us today. For, for everyone listening that wants to find you, connect with you more, uh, website, podcast, uh, please let, let us know where we can find you. 
Yeah, sure. And, you know, I would say first and foremost for that person who is that that uh, that accredited investor who is that uh, having that issue with income taxes, you can find out more at, on our website at firstgencp.com forward slash pay less tax. I think that's a great way to to know more about how we can help you there. Um, as you mentioned before, and I would recommend to everybody, check out episode 202 in, in the Going Long podcast where Jason absolutely crushed it. Um, and then that and the third way I'd say is I love uh, LinkedIn also, too, for those people that prefer social media connections. And, and I think it, I'm the only Billy Keels in, in Barcelona, Spain, so I should be pretty easy to find. So uh, I think any of those three are probably the best way for, uh, for someone to find out more about me and my team. Awesome. And that site is first spelled out F-I-R-S-T-G-E-N-C-P dot com right there. Billy. That's correct. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. To all of you out there, you heard a, a number of examples of taking action in your life, diving forward, pushing to that next step, looking for, for what you want and not just settling for what you have. And so, Billy, thank you so much for joining us. To all the listeners out there, thank you as well. If you like what you hear today, go down there and give us a follow. Give us a ratings and review. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love your feedback. We'll talk to you shortly.